In this video, we're reviewing catcher's obstruction in NFHS baseball. It's commonly referred to as catcher's interference under official baseball rules, but either way, the enforcement will be the same. And this is a rule that most umpires are going to miss in games below the collegiate level, and we need to better understand this rule because the lower the level of play, the more likely it is to occur. So we'll start this video by reviewing the rules associated with catcher's obstruction, and then we'll break down this week's case plays. Now, if you want to see how well you can do on this week's quiz before reviewing it with me, you can find a link to it in the video description. Hi everyone, Patrick Farber from GHSA Baseball, Umpire Development and Umpire Classroom, where we help umpires develop their knowledge and skills. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe to our channel and check out the rest of our videos. Also, if you want next week's case plays emailed to you, there's a link to sign up in the video description. So let's start by reviewing what is catcher's obstruction by looking at the definition of obstruction. Well, 2-22-1. Obstruction is when a catcher or fielder hinders a batter. When obstruction occurs, the ball becomes dead at the end of playing action and bases shall be awarded the runners according to the rule violated. So the definition doesn't necessarily use the term catcher's obstruction, but our key for understanding this rule is that we're looking to enforce obstruction on the batter and not on a runner. And in theory, the obstruction doesn't even need to be committed by the catcher as any defensive player could position themselves to obstruct the batter's ability to hit the ball. Now, the definition doesn't give any examples, but we do get examples in Rule 8-3-1C, which covers base running awards. This rule gives three examples, stepping on or across home plate, pushing the batter to reach the pitch, or touching the bat. Now, let's look at calling the rule by starting with Rule 5-1-2B. It is a delayed dead ball when a catcher or any fielder obstructs a batter. This part of the rule is the same as enforcing obstruction of a runner. It is always a delayed dead ball and we have the same process of identifying it in our games. When the obstruction occurs, we should point at the catcher and call out that's obstruction without giving the time mechanic if the ball is batted into play. Then when all action stops, we signal the catcher's obstruction to the press box by giving the same mechanic as a foul tip and then pointing at the catcher. Now let's discuss the enforcement of catcher's obstruction, rule 8-1-1E. A batter becomes a runner with the right to attempt to score by advancing to first, second, third, and home bases in the listed order when the catcher or any other defensive player obstructs him. Then rule 8-1-2A. A batter runner is awarded first base if he is a runner because of catcher's obstruction. So if we have this scenario happen where the ball is not hit or the ball is simply fouled off, then we are going to award the batter first base. All other runners on base are ruled by the additions to this rule. Any runner attempting to advance, i.e. steal or squeeze, on a catcher's obstruction of the batter shall be awarded the base he is attempting. If a runner is not attempting to advance on the catcher's obstruction, he shall not be entitled to the next base, if not forced to advance because of the batter being awarded first base. If obstruction is enforced, all other runners on the play will return to the base occupied at time of the pitch. The batter is awarded first base if he did not reach base. There's a lot here, but the breakdown is fairly simple. All runners return to their base at the time of pitch unless they are forced to advance by the batter being awarded first, or if they were stealing, in which case we give them the base they were advancing to. Now, important to note is that when we award bases for obstruction, the award of bases must occur regardless of where other runners are on base. So in a situation with runners on second and third, if R2 steals while R3 does not, and we have catcher's obstruction, the award of that base to R2 will result in awarding home to R3. But what happens if we have catcher's obstruction and the ball is put in play? First, let's go back to rule 8-1-1E. Obstruction of the batter is ignored if the batter runner reaches first and all other runners advance at least one base. Note, if obstruction is not enforced, all other runners advance at their own risk. So this tells us that if everyone advances at least one base safely, the obstruction is completely ignored. In fact, the offense won't have the option to try and have it enforced. Once everyone, including the batter runner, advances one base safely, we will play on like it never happened. But what happens if the ball is put in play and the batter runner does not achieve first base? Well, remember, this is a delayed dead ball, so we first have to wait until all playing action stops. Once it does, 
Since all runners, including the batter runner, failed to advance one base safely, we have to enforce the penalty as already discussed. The batter runner is awarded first, and everyone already on base is returned to their time of the pitch position, unless they were stealing or forced to advance by a following runner. Now, let's discuss the hardest part of the rule, 8-1-1E, the coach or captain of the team at bat, after being informed by the umpire in chief of the obstruction, shall indicate whether or not he elects to decline the obstruction penalty and accept the resulting play. First, note that this doesn't say they must choose to accept the penalty. Instead, they have to decline the penalty. This is the same as in other levels of baseball, and the instruction it gives to you is that before the coach has any input, we must first enforce the catcher's obstruction. Then the coach can elect to take the result of the play. So let's look at an example. R3, one out. The catcher obstructs the batter's swing. The ball is hit to F4 and thrown to F3 to retire the batter runner at first base. R3 scores. Once the playing action ends, the umpire should immediately call time and award the obstruction penalty. They will award the batter runner first and put R3 back at third. At this point, the offensive coach would have to inform the crew if he prefers to take the result of the play and would rather take the run and out instead of two runners on base. So now that we've reviewed the rules, let's cover this week's case plays. Case play number one, R2 is on second. F2 obstructs B2, but he hits and reaches first safely. R2, who was not moving on the pitch, is thrown out at home plate. Is this A, the result of the play stands, B, the head coach of the offensive team can take the result of the play or have B2 awarded first and R2 returned to second, or C, the head coach of the offensive team can take the results of the play or have B2 awarded first and R2 awarded third. The correct answer here is A, the result of the play is going to stand. Because R2 safely advanced to third and the batter runner safely advanced to first, everyone is advanced at least one base safely. At that point, the catcher's obstruction is going to be ignored regardless of what happens next. Case play number two. R2 is on second base and does not attempt to advance on the pitch. After B2 takes his position in the batter's box, F2 clearly reaches out over home plate after F1 has made a movement that has committed him to pitch. The batter does not swing. Is this A, this is nothing, B, this is a balk, R2 is awarded third, C, this is catcher's obstruction, R2 stays at second, B2 is awarded first base, or D, this is catcher's obstruction, R2 is awarded third, B2 is awarded first base. The correct answer here is C. This is catcher's obstruction because the catcher reached out over home plate while the pitch was being delivered. Doesn't matter whether or not the batter swings in this scenario because reaching out over the plate we don't want to encourage our batters to swing to have to hit the catcher to get this enforced. We're going to enforce catcher's obstruction, which in this scenario will award the batter first base and R2 will stay at second. Case play number three. R2 is on second base and stealing on the pitch. F2 sees the stealing runner and reaches out over home plate to receive the pitch and attempt to throw out R2 at third. The batter does not swing. Is this A, this is nothing, B, this is a balk, R2 is awarded third. C, this is catcher's obstruction, R2 stays at second, B2 is awarded first base. Or D, this is catcher's obstruction, R2 is awarded third, B2 is awarded first base. The correct answer here is D. This is still catcher's obstruction, and R2, since they were stealing, will be awarded third, and the batter runner will be awarded first base. Case play number four. R2 is on second with one out. F2 obstructs B3, but he hits a ground ball to F4, who throws him out. F3 overthrows third in an attempt to retire R2, who scores on the overthrow. Is this A, this is an immediate dead ball when the obstruction occurs, or B, this is a delayed dead ball? The correct answer here is B. This is a delayed dead ball and time will be called once all playing action occurs. That way we can enforce the obstruction but the coach of the offense could still take the results of the play after it's enforced. Case play number five. R2 is on second with one out. F2 obstructs B3, but he hits a ground ball to F4 who throws him out. F3 overthrows third in an attempt to retire R2 who scores on the overthrow. 
After the playing action ends and time is called, the umpire should A, award the batter runner first and place R2 back at second, B, immediately go to the offensive coach and ask if he wants the play to stand or the penalty for catcher's obstruction enforced, C, nothing, the offensive coach may request time to have the obstruction enforced, or D, nothing, the catcher's obstruction is ignored due to the run scoring. The correct answer here is A, we need to first enforce the penalty for obstruction because all the requirements to ignore it were not met. After enforcing it, then the offensive coach has the ability to come out to us and request that instead we take the results of the play. Case play number six. With the bases loaded and the infield fly rule in effect, F2 obstructs the batter's swing, which results in a high fly ball. Umpires invoke the infield fly rule. The ball is caught. Is this A, the infield fly nullifies the obstruction, the batter runner is out, all other runners remain at their base, or B, the batter is awarded first base, each runner will be awarded one base because of the force situation. The correct answer here is B. The obstruction is going to be enforced. That means we'll award the batter runner first base and all other runners will be awarded another base because of the batter becoming a runner. Case play number seven. R3 is on third base and R2 on second base with one out. F2 obstructs B4 who hits a ground ball to F4. R2 was attempting to steal third even though third base was occupied. B4 is thrown out at first on the play. R3 scores and R2 reaches third. After play ends and time is called, A, award B4 first, place R3 at third and R2 at second. The offensive coach may request to take the result of the play. B, award B4 first, score R3 and award R2 third base. The offensive coach may request to take the result of the play. Or C, the results of the play stands. The correct answer here is B. Because the batter runner did not advance one base safely, we're going to enforce the obstruction. That means awarding the batter runner first base. And since R2 was stealing third, even though third base was occupied, because they're stealing on the catcher's obstruction, we award R2 third base, and that forces R3 to home. Then at the end of the playing action and after the enforcement, the offensive coach has the option to decline the penalty enforcement and take the results of the play. Case play number eight. With R2 on second and R1 on first and one out, B4 hits a pop fly to the second baseman that is declared a legal infield fly. During B's swing, F2 obstructed the swing with his mitt. The defense does not catch the ball and R2 scores with R1 advancing to third base. B4 ends up on second base. After play ends and time is called, A, enforce the obstruction penalty, award B1 first, R2 is forced to third, and R1 is advanced to second. The offensive coach may take the results of the play. B, the result of the play stands, R2 scores, R1 is on third, B4 is safe at second. C, the results of the play stands, R2 scores, R1 is on third, B4 is out, the offensive coach may request the penalty for catcher's obstruction be enforced. The correct answer is A. We're going to enforce the obstruction because the infield fly made it that the batter runner did not advance at least one base safely. So we're going to award the batter runner first, which will result in R1 being forced to second and R2 being forced to third. Then after enforcing that, the offensive coach would have the option to decline the obstruction penalty and take the results of the play. So there you have it, our review of catcher's obstruction in NFHS baseball. If you found this video helpful, please share our videos with other umpires. Also, you can help me produce more content by sending your pictures and videos to media at umpireclassroom.com. You can also help by sending your rules, questions, and case plays to me at patrick at umpireclassroom.com. Thanks again for watching, and as always, I look forward to seeing you on the field.